Yo, 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 what's up, YouTube? It's Jacob Leoparty here, aka the AFL Fantasy Freak. Wow, one day until round one. Ladies, gentlemen, it's time to get excited. So, in this episode, we got a bit of a special one. I'm going to be breaking down my team and going over all the players and why I've selected them. And this is also going to mark the first episode of the series that I'm starting, which is Road to Top 100. So enjoy. So this year, AFL Fantasy looks to be quite different, or not different, but there's lots of unique strategies this year. Um, the new rules look to have changed the way in which the game's being played, so that may have an effect on different types of players in different types of areas. So we'll jump in firstly with my defense. So my first picked guy is Tom Stewart. My reasoning behind this is I think that with the man on the mark rule, these half-back players that present themselves as the switch kick option, they take the kick-ins, they push for handball receives, these guys are going to see an increase in points early. I think Tom Stewart is that number one guy for Geelong. And if you look at his average, he's priced at 96, I believe. 97. So he's priced at 97, and I think over the course of the back end, he was about 10, 10 points on that last year. So I think early we can see Stuart average around 105, particularly with his easy run of games. So that's my reasoning behind starting with Tom Stewart at D1. D2, we have Jaden Short. So Jaden was a guy that I was keen on early in the preseason. I'd um, earmarked him well before the Amy series. I'll uh, throw up a little snippet on the screen of something I wrote about him in an early article. But Jaden looks to be that, that guy for Richmond, that quarterback type. I'm not too concerned with Basha Hooley coming back into the side. I think Hooley's over 30 now. Uh, Richmond are going to want to preserve him, so they're pr he's probably not going to have too much of an impact on Jaden Short. And Jaden Short being that younger guy coming through, I think they're going to prioritise him in that role than Basha Hooley. I think priced at 89, he's probably got, he's probably around that 95 to 100 range. I will. Note quickly though that Jaden Short is one guy that I am somewhat reconsidering with another guy, uh, being Sam Doherty. So Doherty may come into my side. I've had Doherty in and out in uh, various other guys' position during the preseason, but at the moment I've got Jaden Short. My next defender is Caleb Daniel. So Caleb Daniel. Very much the same as the other two guys. He's that quarterback for the Bulldogs. As you can see, this is a bit of a theme. This is just because I think that these guys are going to get off the chain early with these new rules. And until teams develop systems in the early rounds to counteract this, I think these guys are going to be see an increased point output. And therefore, I think they're all underpriced slightly. So Caleb Daniel... He will be the centre of a tag, um, but I think I'm willing to take the punt on him and just assume that teams w won't clamp down on him too hard and he should be able to score well. My next guy is Jordan Clark. So Jordan Clark was one that was talked up early in the preseason as one that ha would have upside. 
Uh, he obviously absolutely blitzed the Amy series, scored 135 off 66%. He, he missed a full quarter and did that. So when you've got a guy priced at 55, it's hard to say no to that. I think his role in the side, while his job security is talked up, not being great, Chris Scott has confirmed that he will be playing round one. I think he brings an asset to the team, highlighted by in the last quarter, two minutes on the clock, inboard kick, 50 minute, fifty metre bullet pass, straight to their player, straight down the corridor, and they score the winning goal. So I think that sort of stuff is going to keep Clark safe in the side. And although Mitch Duncan still has to come in, we may see Clark go back to half back. He probably stays on a wing. I don't think either role is going to really hurt his scoring. And priced at 55, there's 20 points plus of upside there. So he's one that I'm keen on as a mid-pricer. All right, so this next guy, he's a little bit more unique, if you will. Um, I really like the look of this guy. So we have Oleg Markov. He's priced at 49. I think he has a very good role at Gold Coast. He's quick. And judging by the way Gold Coast look to utilize him, he looks to be a very important part coming out of the defense. So not only was I impressed with the way in which Gold Coast were using him, watching him off the ball, his movement patterns to get into space and to open up opportunities to receive the ball. Although he wasn't utilised, those patterns looked really good to me. And the way the game's played, I can see him being utilised more often than not in those situations. So priced at 49, I don't think it's unrealistic that Markov can average 70 to 80 this year. And that's why he's in my side. Now, this guy is in everyone's side. Hayden Young, absolute lock. Uh, priced in the low 40s, I believe. Yeah, so priced at 44. Uh, he'll probably, bare minimum, averages 65, but he'll probably be a 70 guy. At the price, you have to lock him. His job security is great. He'll probably take... Most of the kick-ins, although Luke Ryan may take some as well, but at that price, nothing to worry about. Lock and load. I just want to quickly touch on the fact that I've got no rookies on the ground in my defense. So Hayden Young's my D6, and this is because I think the rookie job security and scoring potential is the worst out of all zones. So I'm trying to minimize having as many rookies in this area, as I think it'll be hard enough just to maintain bench options in defense. And therefore, I think having rookies on the field in this area isn't the greatest idea. All right, so moving on to the midfielders, guys. I forgot to mention in the last clip also that I won't be covering the rookie players and why I've selected them on the bench. I have uploaded a rookie guide and there is an article on my website explaining why I have the players I have. So we'll jump straight into the first guy I have on the field, and that's Zach Merritt. So you're paying the big bucks here, but in my opinion, I think midfielders this year that have a great mix of inside ability and outside ability will be the strongest, and I think Zach Merritt is the best in the competition at both formats of being a midfielder. So... For me, he's priced at 116. He's in the prime of his career. He's just been elevated up to the leadership group and he looks to be in a side that is wanting to seek improvement. So for me, I can see Merritt being the highest averaging player across all zones this year. And I think an average of 120 plus is certainly on the cards. So Merritt for me will be my captain most weeks, if not all weeks. Uh, I'll touch on captains in another video, but for me, I like to keep my captain consistent as then you don't miss any any of the high scores and 
you may have to cop some low scores, but at least you get a consistent average across the year. So my next guy is Jackson McRae. So similar to Merritt, he's a great inside and outside mix. I think with Trelaw coming into the side, it's not going to affect him too much as it looks like the Bulldogs are pretty set on using McRae as an inside mid this year. He's attended 90% of CBAs in the Amy series. So while I expect that will drop slightly, his usage will still be high. And I think Bontempelli and in particular, Josh Dunkley will be the guys that spend the most time forward. I think McRae will spend time on a wing, but with the speed of the ball movement and the outside players being utilized a lot this year, I don't think that's a negative. And having averaged 123 in the past, priced at 113, I think there's upside in McRae and I think he will outperform his average this year. So that's why I've got him. I've also got him in case I do need a backup captain option. All right, so this next guy is pretty unique. Not many people have talked about him. I've got a little bit of a soft spot for him because I owned him in the back end of last year and he performed really well. That's Ollie Wines. So Ollie Wines, Port Adelaide midfielder. I like Ollie this year, despite the fact that he's only ever been that mid 90s to 100 guy for the last six years. But this year, I think, Port Adelaide, very strong side. They're going to win a lot of games and they're going to beat a lot of sides by a fair margin. He's going to be the main man in that engine room. So Boak is going to spend a bit more time forward. Rockcliffe's getting older. They're going to rotate some guys through there, but Port are going to have to rely heavily on Wines this year to carry the sides midfield. I think... In the last couple pre-seasons, he's had some injuries. He's had a few interruptions. Whereas this year, he's had a full pre-season. He's fully fit. He looks ready to go. And having averaged 112, I think it was, in the back end of last year, I'm expecting that Wines this year can post an average closer to the 110 mark. So that's why I've selected him. Another unique option for mine is Andrew Brayshaw. So, one that's been disregarded and almost ignored this year, and for good reason, he's quite risky and he's unique, but for me, there's plenty of signs that indicate further improvement. So, he's going into his fourth year, he's just been elevated up into the leadership group, and he looks to be Fremantle's number one midfielder this year. So last year, Brayshaw averaged 42% centre bounce attendances, which was the sixth most for Frio, off the top of my head. This year, in the two pre-season games, in the scratch match, he was at 86%, and in the Amy series, 76% CBAs. So he looks to have a big tick in centre bounce attendance. And he also looks to increase his time on ground. And I expect that his time on ground this year will be up by five-ish percent. So those factors considered, I think Brayshaw will go up another level. And like Wines, I think he can be in that 105 to 110 mark. So I've got him at 10, maybe 15 points underpriced and I've got him as an underpriced premium option. So this next guy is the third underpriced premium option, if you will, and that's Tim Taranto. Tim Taranto's averaged 113 in the past. Uh, obviously, people are aware of this, and therefore he's a popular selection. Me personally, I'm not the biggest fan of Taranto, I think whilst his CBA usage was high, what a lot of people didn't pick up on was the fact that he spent a lot of time forward when he wasn't at the centre bounce. And so I think his average will be around that 105 mark and I don't think he gets back to those super heights that he'd set in the past. 
The reason why I have Taranto is because he's a high percent owned player. And if he was to go bang early, then I won't be left behind the rest of the competition having owned him. Whereas vice versa, if I choose to leave him on the table and he does get back to that 110 plus, then I'm going to be disadvantaged. So I think I'd rather start with Taranto. And if there's other options that I like better early, he's one that I'd potentially be willing to jump off to get onto a different guy. Next, we have Darcy Parrish. So Darcy is one that I'm quite bullish on this year. Under Woosher, he was never really given the opportunity to flourish as an inside midfielder. And whilst he did get time in there, he spent a lot of time forward. I think now with Rudden coming in to coach, he's changed a few things up and one of those looks to be Parrish going inside full time. So from what I've seen over the preseason, Darcy looks to really took his game to another level. He's really put in a lot of hard work this preseason. And I think behind Zach Merritt, he could be the next highest used guy at the centre bounces. For me, I love the way Darcy goes about it. And I think that his mix of inside to outside ratio is quite good. Whilst his tackle numbers weren't super high in the Amy series, his tenacity around the contest indicated to me that he's capable of putting high tackle number games up and his explosion and spread from the contest showed that he was willing to get in amongst the link up chains and therefore, I think he'll fill all stat lines relatively consistently and an average of around 100 can be expected for Darcy Parrish this year. Priced at 82, that's quite a fair chunk of upside and therefore, he's one that I'm willing to take the risk on. All right, so this, this next guy as well is relatively unique. Uh, by this point, you guys are probably thinking, holy fuck, this guy has... A unique midfield he's going bananas with pods but I'm pretty confident in my research and from what I've seen this preseason and these are my opinions on who I think has good upside this year so my next guy is Dom Tyson now this guy is a bit of a forgotten one uh, he's been getting a lot of flack over the preseason because of his injury uh, history, but the reality is the guy looks fit. He's had a full preseason, no interruptions. He's at a new club, which he hasn't played a game for yet, so he's going to be hungry to show his worth to that club. He's got a peak average of 93, and he's also averaged over 90 multiple times. His centre bounce usage was high, in the preseason across all games that I watched. And whilst Cunnington, Jamont, Polek and Anderson are still to come into the site, I think North Melbourne plan to use Tyson as an inside mid and as an outside mid. So whilst his CBAs might drop slightly, he'll still be used on the outside on a, on a wing, I'd say. And priced at 54, He's 39 points under his peak average and he's fit. So for me, I can't see how he doesn't average at least 75. There's 20 points there, plus potential for more growth. So he's one that whilst his injury history is bad, I have to take it on face value and he's fit now. So he's one that I'm willing to start with and take that risk. My last midfielder on the field is Tom Powell. So... If you guys read my rookie guide, you'd know that I wasn't super hot on Tom Powell. The main reason I have Tom is because he's highly owned. He looks like he's got decent job security in the early rounds. And that's something that I'm looking for. So for that reason, Tom comes in and he fills my last position on my midfield. So having seen my defense and my mid now, You'd probably be thinking, bloody hell, this guy's got a stacked side. 
and that's because my defense and my midfield are relatively stacked. I've chosen to spend a lot of my salary cap in those areas this year, as I think that's where the points will be early. So jumping into my rucks, the ruck is a hot topic this year. Uh, there's lots of people approaching this in different ways. And as you can see, and you may have heard if you follow me on Facebook, I'm a big advocate for the Ruck 2 rookie. So my theory with the Rucks this year is with the faster play, less stoppages, less long down the line opportunities, I think we're going to see less hit outs, less marks. And the big guys in Gorn and Grundy also have other queries. So Gorn's time on ground will be decreasing this year. He also looks to spend quite a bit of time forward with Jackson in the ruck. Then we have Brody Grundy. So it looks like Collingwood are also going with a similar approach. And in the Amy series, he did share the ruck with Darcy Cameron and also Mason Cox. And it looks like Collingwood are going to go with the three big guys into the real year. So when paying top dollar for these types... For me, there's too many things that indicate a decrease and therefore I don't want to spend my big bucks on guys that I don't think will hold their price. So I've opted for value in my ruck and gone with Jared Witts. Jared Witts, he's 23 points under his career best. He was obviously hampered by injury last year and so far this year he looks to be Flying, he looks to be the way in which I saw him cover the ground in the Amy series indicated to me that he's back at full health. So, even though I think Ruck's points will decrease this year, there's too much upside in wits, so I think he still increases in value based off his starting price. Then I've gone with Matt Flynn, so controversial, but I think. Having the rookie ruck on the field is the way to go. It opens up so much salary cap for you to spend in other areas and invest that money into players who I think have more upside than what Gorn and Grundy present. So, for example, I've spent the same amount of coin on Jackson McRae as what a Brody Grundy costs. But Grundy, I think, will be around that 110 mark. Whereas Jackson McRae, I think, can get closer to 120. So that's why I've gone with the rookie on the field. I also think the rookie ruck is a safe bet. They're going to get 15 to 20 hit outs, so that's three points. And they're going to have the same scoring output as other rookies. So especially with Matt Flynn, he's the GWS number one ruck. So his job security is going to be fantastic. And with other rookie rucks available early, such as Meek, Fullerton, and Hunter, I think there's enough cover there to take that risk and generate the cash early and get to one of these bigger guys once they fall in price a bit. So jumping straight into my F1, we've got Jordan Degoe. Jordan's one that I'd almost written off completely early in the preseason. I didn't believe that his midfield minutes would be legitimate, but from what I've seen, it looks like Collingwood genuinely looked to use Dugowie in the midfield this year. There's slight concern over the fact that Collingwood don't have that strong of a forward line, and therefore the need for Dugowie playing in the forward could be real as well, but... I think Collingwood are going to use other types and obviously Dugowie is still going to spend time forward. He's going to play that Dustin Martin type role, but I think he can still kick enough goals from the middle to be effective on the scoreboard. And based off what we saw in the Amy series, he looks to be able to go another level when given the midfield minutes. I look at Jordan Degoe as a Christian Petrarca 2.0 this year and priced at 79, I think 
90 plus is not unrealistic for Jordan. So I think there's value there. And with me not liking any of the premium forward options, he's the one that I'm deciding to go with this year. F2, Tom Phillips. Not much to say here. Everyone that's interested in AFL fantasy probably knows by now that, that Tom's a, a pretty solid lock. There's Tom Mitchell to come back. Wingard will come back. Scrimshaw will come back. All these guys will be rotated through the wings and through the middle where Tom looks to play. But the reality is Tom's got a pretty firm grip on his spot in the side. And I expect his scoring to be 90 plus easily. Uh, that's minimum 10 points, but he could even get to mid 90s to high 90s. So, and if he does provide that sort of value, he may even end up being good enough to be in your side come year's end. So he's one that you certainly should be starting with at the start of the year. After Tom, it drops off a little bit in terms of value of players or, or worth. So we've gone with Nick Hind at F3. I think Hind looks to be a super pick and he's one of the better mid-price value forwards this year. He looks to have that half-back role that I was talking about earlier when going over my defenders. I think this role is going to be super fantasy friendly earlier and based off the way he played, the way Essendon looked to use him coming out of defense, he looks to be super valued and I think his scoring will be 70 plus easily, probably closer to that 80 mark. He comes in priced at 54, so there's plenty of upside there and he's one that I'm heavily interested in this year. He did receive a little bit of a shoulder knock, but he's been all cleared from that. So it's nothing to be concerned about. And whilst he has played a small forward role in the past for St Kilda, he's been utilised in this halfback position in the VFL. So he does have experience playing this position. And therefore, I think that can result to consistency at AFL level. Traditionally, I avoid picking small forwards. But I have opted for Orazio Fantasia this year based off a couple of things. So for starters, he's priced at 46 and he has a career high average of 78. He's been able to post 70 plus averages on multiple occasions and that's been in a small forward role. He finds himself at Port Adelaide, who are a far superior side to what Essendon's ever been at the time that Fantasia has been at that club. I think that's going to result in extra scoring and more opportunity to kick goals, take marks, etc. So Fantasia looks to be humming at the moment and I can see Fantasia having a career best season this year. I think his scoring will be up and down, being a small forward, but he does come up against North Melbourne in round one, so he should get every opportunity to get off to a good start. And I think there's 25, 30 points of upside here, so that's why I've gone with Fantasia. He also has that defender forward dual position, so you can swing him back if you have an unexpected injury or whatnot. He provides that extra cover for unexpected situations. My last two spots in my forward line, we've gone with Chad Warner. So over the Amy series, Chad was the one rookie that I was most impressed with. His ability outside and inside was fantastic. And I think his job security is very high. I think he's a great asset to the Swans and they'll want to further develop him this year. I think he's the best rookie this year. So therefore he's on my field and I think he should be on your field as well. Last spot, Miles Bergman. So 
Miles is one that's 50-50 for round one. He might not actually get a game. I do have plans in store if that's the case, but I think Miles has the greatest scoring potential outside of Warner in the forward rookie department. And so I've chosen to put him on the field. If he doesn't play, then I'll obviously be switching him out for someone else and I'll be going with a different strategy there. But for now, he sits there at F6. So there you have it, guys. That's my team this year. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, I wasn't actually going to share my side this year, but I thought, fuck it, I'll get it out there. Show some people what what I'm looking at doing this year. I want to be super transparent with you guys because I want to help you guys improve and I want to give you the insight into things that myself as a top coach is looking at doing this year. Having said that, this is going to be the first episode of this new series I'm starting. So I'm going to be documenting each week what moves I'm making, what I'm doing with my team, and it's sort of going to be a road to a top 100 position hopefully this year because that's where I'm looking to finish in AFL Fantasy. If you've enjoyed this video, guys, leave it a thumbs up. Drop a comment below if you need any help with your team. I'm looking to go live on Facebook this afternoon, so be sure to follow me there. If you've got any questions, jump in the live stream and I'll answer them. Hit the subscribe button. And until next time, guys, I'll catch you in the next one. Keep climbing up the ranks. Look, I'm about my pledge, bitch. I'm decked up on blue bills. And I won't stop until the cash pit. There's like fall leaves in the bag fill. Tell her out of my face if she coming with that bullshit. Quit to save my peace. I'm so after school special.